So Liberty One, most of you know that we have models one through nine. Those are somewhat easy to remember. We've got some other models that are what we call dividend focus models. They're kind of special models in a sense. If you can name all three of them, you'll get one of these. Well, that's not fair. Ruben knows them by heart. He is midnight ready on that one. Let's hear it, Ruben. Ruben, are you midnight ready on these? 10, 11, and Spectrum? Or... Okay, so Spectrum is one of that. Yeah, you're going to win one of these. I'll give you one. So 10 and 11 have a special name, just like Spectrum does. Do you happen to know what those are? Uh, tactical is one. Tactical Income Solution. There's Tactical Growth Solution, and there's Spectrum. So you know 10, 11, and Spectrum are the special models. You didn't know the exact names, but that's okay. I'll still give you that one. 10 and 11. 10 11, that works. Because that, fundamentally, that's what they were when we first started them, but then we gave them okay. a, kind of a unique name, so that's good. Okay, well, let me ask you then on, on, on there's two, tactical income mm -hmm. is 50% security? Yeah, we'll get, we'll get to all that stuff, I promise. Yep. So what I want to do is spend a little time just diving into the basics of Liberty One. Before I do that, I really want to set the stage pertaining to how and when we use Liberty One products. Like Rock said, whenever we do advisory business in this region, it's 99% of the time Liberty One. The other 1% is 14B accounts when a client absolutely demands a customized allocation with a few holdings that they're going to choose themselves and us sprinkling in some of our recommendations. So 99% of the advisory business we do is Liberty One advisory. 1% is 14B. The rest of what we do when we're not doing advisory is usually variable annuities and a few 5MC accounts here and there, depending on the client. Okay. We, so Ben, when you say Liberty One, you're talking about all the portfolios. Yep. One, one Liberty through, one, one. One through nine, right. One through nine, and then 10, 11, and 12. Tactical income, tactical growth, and spectrum. Rarely do the advisors in our region sell the models at face value. When you're selling a model, what you really need to do is weave whatever you're recommending, whether it's an annuity, a model, what have you, you need to weave your recommendation into a story that makes sense to the client. Finance is very intangible. They're buying something they can't really touch, they can't see it, they're really buying your service. Yes, they're gonna get prospectuses and fund reports and all that kind of stuff in the mail, but no one reads that. So you have to create some tangibility to what you're selling. You have to make whatever you're recommending, be it an annuity or one of these, you have to make it come to life so the client understands tangibly what this product or what the service is going to ultimately do for them. Because they're not buying the investment, they're buying the solution that the investment solves. So there's a saying that I've used for a long time is the most popular thing that's sold in a hardware store is a quarter inch drill bit. No one in the world needs a quarter inch drill bit. What they need is a quarter inch hole. They're buying the outcome. They're buying the hole. The drill bit doesn't do them any good. It just gets into the outcome. These sorts of allocations are like buying the drill bit. What you need to paint the picture for to the client is what they're ultimately getting out of this. What are they tangibly getting? They're getting the quarter inch hole. So I'm gonna walk you through really briefly the quick version of what we call the growth and income system. And this is a system that easily three quarters of our clients use right now. Not every client we have is retired. Some are pre-retired, so not everyone uses this system. But the majority of our money that our clients have is in this system if they're retired. I'm going to show you the system because this is how we tangibly create value. And I'm going to show you where these types of models fit into this system and how we use them, okay? And that will paint a really clear picture on how to sell these. Generally, what we do is we'll, I'm going to basically do this exactly like if you were a client seeing it for the first time. I'm going to go a little bit faster, but I want you just to see the concept. I'm going to use a million dollars because it's a round number. You can do this with $50,000, with $5 million, doesn't matter. So let's say someone comes to you with a $1 million nest egg. Mentally, in their, in their head, they tend to think of it all as one lump sum of money. And if someone's about to be retired or is retired, do they generally want to be pretty conservative or pretty aggressive with that money? Pretty conservative, right? Because they view themselves as retired. Okay. Well, let's say they kind of lump that all into one bucket and they decide they're going to draw a 5% income stream from that bucket to supplement their Social Security and their pension, if they have one. 
That, of course, comes out to $50,000 of income. But let's say an emergency comes up. They need to get their hands on $60,000 for whatever reason. Big medical expense, they want to pay cash for a new car, whatever comes up. Help the grandkids pay for college, whatever that is. They need $60,000. Well, if you take $60,000 from a million, you reduce your income base. Now you're taking 5% from a smaller number. You just gave yourself a pay cut in retirement. It's the last thing you want to do. So what we always have our clients do is take their nest egg, and rather than having it all in one lump sum, is we have them divide their money into two buckets, the growth bucket and the income bucket. The income bucket generally is about two-thirds to 75% of the money, and the rest goes in the growth bucket. Ultimately, how much income Go, how much money goes in the income bucket depends on how much income the client needs. From the income bucket, naturally, there will be some sort of withdrawal stream, and that withdrawal stream will translate into cash flow for the client. So naturally, the income bucket generates income. The growth bucket is set aside to let grow. Now, this money here, this cash flow, this is very important to the client. It represents their standard of living. It's how they pay their bills. It's how they live their life. Since this money is very important, it makes this money very important, because this ultimately creates that. So if this is very important, is that going to be pretty aggressive or pretty conservative? Conservative. Right. On a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being very risky, this is like a 3 or a 4 on that scale. It's not going to be a 1. You're not going to throw it in a CD and earn 0.2%, but you're going to be moderately conservative with that money. You want to give them some good opportunity for growth, but you want to limit the range of outcomes. You want to limit the volatility. This money over here, on the, other, on the other hand, on the growth side, what happens over here has nothing to do with what happens down here. There's really no relationship in the short term. Since this has no bearing on this, is it safe to say you can be a little more aggressive with this in the short term? Of course. On that same 1 to 10 scale, this is a 6 or a 7. Moderately aggressive. You're not swinging for the fences, you're not throwing it all in LinkedIn and Facebook IPOs, but you're going to be moderately aggressive with the money to give yourself a good chance for some long-term growth. That sets up the system. Now let me show you what it accomplishes for the client. Whenever I'm engaging a client or a prospect, and I train everyone on the team to do this, you need to do what's called, I call it the light bulb effect. You need to give your prospects that aha moment. You need to get them to think about their money differently than they thought about it before. Make that little light bulb go off. When you do that for somebody, you get instant credibility and you win them over. And once you explain things in a way they've never heard it before, it doesn't matter how many other advisors they're interviewing, when you give them that moment, it's like boom, it's, cl it's clarity, it's confidence, and they're all in. Okay. Then, it, then it's not so much about what the investment is or what the fees are, it's about what the solution is and that's what they're buying. All right, so what this does. First thing it does is it gives your client a place to go get money for that emergency. Say they need $20,000, $60,000, whatever. Take the, take the family to Disney World, buy a new car, replace a furnace, a transmission, whatever. $20,000 expense comes up, they can take that $20,000 from the growth bucket because it has no bearing on what happens down here. Remember in the first example I showed you when it was all in one place and they took the money from the top, it affected their income. This gives them a place to go get $20,000 without affecting their cash flow, without affecting their standard of living. That's a very basic thing that it accomplishes. The second thing it accomplishes is let's say this two fifty dollars grows to $300,000. Sometimes, so like last year, that takes one year. That's a 20% return. Most investments that were moderately aggressive did better than 20% last year. So sometimes that takes a year. Sometimes that takes three, four, or five years. If you started investing in 2007, the market fell out from under you, took some time to recover, and then some. Now, all along that way, this was still coming along, so it didn't really affect your lifestyle. You weren't worried about ups and downs here because this has no bearing on this. But over time, this tends to happen. 
Sometimes it takes a few years, sometimes it takes a year. But the key thing here is as this happens, you're going to take that $50,000 of profit and you're going to shift it over here for the client. What that accomplishes is two things. Number one, you're increasing this base, which increases the bottom line. By taking the gains from the growth bucket, feeding them to the income bucket, you're giving your client a raise. The second thing you're doing by shifting these gains is you're protecting the gains as you go by moving the gains from the more aggressive bucket to the more conservative bucket. Gives you a place to go get money when you need it for emergencies. It perpetually feeds itself because you're going to keep doing this every time these gains happen. So it perpetually makes this number bigger to keep pace with inflation. And you're taking those gains and you're protecting those gains by moving from one bucket to the other. Now, the most fun part for my clients, and this is where you can really hit home with them. This is really, this all sounds good, but you can really strike a chord with them. In that discovery meeting, I like to ask, you know, how do you envision your retirement playing out? Are you going to travel a lot, visit the grandkids? What's on your bucket list? And just let them kind of unload a little bit. And, and all those things they just unload with, you're going to put in the memory bank for when you meet with them for the proposal, for the mapping guy. And let's say, yeah, you know, let's say that they say, yeah, you know, our grandkids, they're just, they're spread out all over the country. And it, it, takes, a, it takes some time, it takes some money to go visit everybody. We want to make sure we can really visit the family. Whatever that thing is, you relate to them in this manner. You, you tell them, in reality, we rarely move the full $50,000 of gain over. And they'll, they'll pause for a second, and they'll be like, wait, what do you mean? Normally what we would do is we'd call you up and we'd say, hey, Ruben, just wanted to let you know, your growth bucket, we have a nice $50,000 gain. You know from all of our conversations that we need to do something with that gain. We want to slide a good piece of it to the income bucket, but before we decide how much to slide, I want to talk to you about any big expenses you might have coming up. I know that you want to make sure you've got some extra money set aside to visit the grandkids throughout the year. How about we take $10,000 of that gain and we just kick that gain out to you and instead of moving the full $50,000 over, we'll just move $40,000 over here. That way you've got the extra money you need to visit the grandkids throughout the year, take care of your flights and all your travel expenses and we'll give you a raise and protect the other $40,000. So I'll hypothetically lay that scenario out there because it resonates with them based on what they want their retirement to look and feel like. So you're, you're basically showing them right off the bat in the presentation, when this happens, that's what's going to give you the money to do the things you want to do in retirement. And you customize that part of the presentation based on what they actually want to do. And it's like, oh, that's how that works. And I guarantee if there's a husband and a wife in there, and the wife is just adamant, you know, the grandma can't wait to see the grandkids, this is her ticket to doing that, and she'll, she'll nudge the husband and say, this is what we're doing. And it, it, it's all based on just making that happen. It has nothing to do with the actual investments that you're choosing. You're showing them the path to make that happen. You can show them financial profiles and e-money, running the numbers and fancy charts all day long, but something as simple as this that just gives that grandma that moment of, oh, so that's how we're going to visit them all the time. It gives them the ability to do that without affecting their cash flow. And you're giving them a raise. Now, some clients will say to me, well, Ben, I don't want to protect those gains. Let, let's let this ride. This is really going well. Why don't we leave that full 300000 in there? And let's just let that keep growing. And I'll flat out say you're being greedy. <laughs> right? Warren Buffett has a saying. He said, be greedy when others are fearful and be fearful when others are greedy. Right? When you're greedy, that's when you need to be fearful. When everything just looks like it's going to keep going up, everything's overpriced, and that's when you've got to be fearful. So I'll say you're being greedy. Let's move this 40000 over. Let's kick you $10,000. If the market keeps going up, that's fantastic. You still have $250,000 working for you. Mm -hmm. If it goes down, you'll be glad you just did this and this. You won't be kicking yourself. You can't go wrong. If you, if you shift these gains over, and then all of a sudden this 250 falls to 220 that client might call you up. Say, hey, I just noticed all this volatility in this account. You'll say, that's okay. That's the growth bucket has no bearing on your standard of living. Aren't you glad you just moved 50000 You just gave yourself a raise? You can go visit the grandkids? 
they'll, they'll apologize for calling. I'm sorry to bother you. you know? <laughs> right? Not literally, but you know what I mean. You really, you're really painting a picture, and you're really insulating them. You're you're making sure that this, like Rock said, the clients are buying predictability and sustainability. You're really insulating everything that's going on. You're letting them live their life without having to worry too much about what the markets are doing day to day, month to month, year to year, all that kind of stuff. This creates tangibility in a very intangible industry. You, you weave in their little nuances about what they're trying to do into the story and it works. You can use this with just about anybody as you weave their personal situation into it. What I love about this presentation is you can do this on a napkin or a legal pad if you had to. Michael and, and Pete, when they meet with prospects for the first time, maybe in a restaurant or in a, in a, at a coffee shop, whatever the case may be, it's very easy to, and it's impressive really, to throw this on the back of a napkin because you're laying it out the way they've never heard it before. And if anything, you just generically do it, even if you don't know a lot about their personal situation, you generically do it and it gets them thinking, hey, you know what, this Michael guy kind of knows what he's talking about. I've never heard this before. Maybe I will come in and, and meet with him in person and do a formal discovery. If anything, just wets the whistle and it gets that second meeting on the books because they really are impressed with what you're showing them here. So it can be done really quickly on the back of a napkin if you have to. You just have to practice it. Now we're videotaping this for a reason. Uh, we'll probably send this video out to Ruben as the regional director and you can kind of siphon it off to your team. If, you're, if your people get really good at this, it can really help their sales. It really, really will. Okay. <clears throat> Any questions or comments on that? Just big picture before I dive into these buckets a little bit. Okay. I'm going to erase this. So let's fill up these buckets. When you think of income generating investments, what are some of the first things that come to mind? Anybody shout it out? Come on, in annuities, right? Annuities, yeah. All day long, variable annuities. So variable annuities, they are designed to generate consistent income. A typical, it depends on the company, a typical income stream from an annuity is maybe four or five percent per year off of whatever you put in depending on the age of the client, depending on if it's a joint benefit or a single. Let's just, for sake of easy math, let's call it 5% income stream. So an annuity, in general, will generate about a 5% income stream for life off of what you put in. Now, a lot of annuities offer some sort of step up. So I'm assuming income is starting right away. Forget about the roll up. We'll talk about that in a second. Let's just say they're putting money in Income starts right away, so what they put in is what their original income withdrawal rate is based off of. Annuities have fees, of course. They're, you're paying for insurance. You're paying for guarantees. Mortality and expense ratio, uh, let's call that 1.5%. Depends on what you're using. If it's a four-year product, might be a little more. If it's an eight-year product, maybe a little less. That's the cost of the m and &E. The cost of the living benefit varies a little bit from carrier to carrier, but let's call that 1% a year for the living benefit. The underlying sub-accounts, the mutual funds you're buying inside the variable annuity, have their own fees too. And it varies, anywhere from 0.75 to 1.5% depending on the fund, but let's just call that 1% as well. We'll call that sub-accounts. Depending on the size of the account, there may be an additional 0.15 or 0.25 admin fee, which often gets waived if it's over 100000 So let's not weave that into the equation right now. But what you've got here is one, two, three and a half percent fees coming out of the account, and we know the client is withdrawing 5%. So in reality, every year, or at least in the first year, there's an 8.5% draw from that account when you factor in the fees and, the, uh, and the, the money that the client is taking out. Now, once you start taking income from a variable annuity, there is an opportunity to get a raise as you go. Most annuity companies will look at 
a one year or a three year period, and if you happen to have a new high water mark, they'll use that high water mark for the new 5% income stream. So if you had your money in here, you dropped, I don't know, whatever, let's say $500,000, 5% income off of that is $25,000 a year. And here are your years along the bottom. If the investment goes down in value, and you never crest over that original two hundred and fifty, dollars well then two hundred and fifty dollars uh, over that original five hundred, twenty-five thousand dollars $25,000 is basically what you're going to get. If you happen to catch a high water mark here, and this bumps up to $550,000, well, then your 5% is based off of that for the rest of your life, even if it goes back down from there. The hard part about catching these high water marks is you need to do at least this in terms of your return just to capture that high water mark. You have one bad year in the beginning in terms of the market performance, and you're withdrawing money, and these fees are happening, you never catch that. It's just too hard. There's so many clients that I have from 2006, 2007 that invested at the peak where it fell and their income base is up here, their account value is down here because they were withdrawing money and fees are coming out. They're never going to catch that because you need to have a monster, monster return and overcome these fees along the way. So it's very hard to get consistent income increases inside of variable annuities for that reason. Now, I still use them. They're cert they certainly play a role in the income bucket. I'll explain how and why I use them, but I'm also going to show you how we use these models to solve this dilemma also. I'm going to erase that now. All right, going back to growth and income. I'm not going to draw the whole thing out, just the basics here. More often than not, just because you have two buckets doesn't mean your clients are only going to have two accounts. They're just buckets. Inside each bucket, you may have one, two, three, four more accounts. You'll have husband and wife will have accounts, you'll have traditionals, you'll have Roths, etc. So don't think of buckets as number of accounts. Just think of that's ways that you classify your accounts. Segments those accounts in their mind. <laughs> what I will use over here quite often is usually a VA of some sort and definitely tactical income solution, which is what Ruben referred to as Liberty One number 10. Over here, a lot of times, I will use Spectrum. Maybe I'll use like a Liberty One number six or maybe a seven, something more aggressive, one of our more aggressive allocations. And if necessary, I'll even have a third arm here maybe that has a variable annuity that I'm just going to buy so I can let that roll up base compound and eventually turn that income stream on down the road. So it just depends on the client situation. Rarely, rarely, rarely will I have a case where I'm actually using five different accounts. I'll mix and match these depending on the client situation and what I'm trying to accomplish. You make it too complicated, it gets too hard to sell, too much to follow. But I'm just giving you the types of, the types of products I'll use. If someone's retiring, you're basically going to start an income stream from these right away. <coughs> Now, for those of you who aren't as familiar with Tactical Income Solution yet, I'm going to get you up to speed with the 30,000 foot view. We'll dive into details here in a second. This is a dividend-focused investment allocation. The current dividend yield on this is about 3.8%. So that's the approximate dividend yield. The S&P 500 current dividend yield, so the index fund, S&P current dividend is 1.81%. That's as of today. I just looked it up this morning. So this is a fantastic dividend. This allocation is only made up of six sectors. Consumer food, consumer staples, 
Energy, utilities, telecom, pharmaceuticals. We invest in 25 different stocks, individual stocks, not mutual funds, in those six sectors. We like those six sectors because we refer to them as recession resistant. No matter what's going on in the economy, people still pay their cell phone bill, they still pay their electric bill, whatever prescription drugs they're taking, they're going to continue to take. Consumer food, consumer staples, energy, utilities, telecom, pharmaceuticals. There's no retail, no finance, no technology, no infrastructure. Just those six boring sectors, but they pay a fantastic dividend, and we balance that out with bonds. So 50% stocks, 50% bonds and cash. Now some of you might be thinking, wow, 50% bonds? Well, when interest rates go up, bond values fall. Are we sure we want to be 50% in bonds? We're holding the right kind of bonds. Of this allocation, 25%, this piece here, is floating rate bonds. As interest rates rise, floating rate bonds have interest rates that rise too. They float, which is good for the bond. If you have interest paying this versus interest paying this, your bonds are worth more. That's a good thing. If you own adjustable rate mortgages, if you're the bank and you hold those, you want interest rates to go up because then your mortgage is worth more. Now, these are not floating rate mortgages, but I share that with you because it relates the concept a little better. The rest of this 25% is divided into uh, high-yield bonds, junk bonds. It has a fantastic dividend. It's only 10%. And the rest are two short-term bond funds. So floating rate, short duration, and high yield. If you're going to own bonds, those are the bonds to use. Back in January, everyone was calling for higher interest rates. What have interest rates done since January? You guys know? Yep. They've gone down. So bond values have actually risen quite a bit, which has made this piece of the equation work out really well. Now, if you're saying to yourself, gosh, I don't want anything to do with bonds, that's great. We've got you covered. You're the advisor, you do what you feel is right for the client. We've got another allocation called Tactical Growth Solution, which has the exact same stocks, but no bonds. Exact same sectors, but no bonds. So Tactical Growth Solution, instead of a 2% allocation in 25 different stocks, which is 50% of the pie, it's a 4% allocation in 25 stocks. That gets you to 96% equities, 4% cash. So the sectors and the dividend is what's key. The bonds certainly give you some stability. The standard deviation of this allocation is very low. The beta is very low. By the way, don't talk about that stuff with clients. I never use that. I'm just sharing that with you. You'll see that in a second here when I hand these out. So emphasis on the dividend. This is absolutely key. Variable annuities, we're not going to get into that, but you guys understand basically how those work. The only thing I'm going to say here is I'll use VAs, and I'm, I'm kind of partial to Transamerica and Jackson. Take Jackson, for example. They have no investment restrictions. So what I'll do in here is I'll buy some mid-caps, some small caps, some international, all the stuff that my clients won't own in these allocations. Small, mid, international investments have some really nice upside. But if you get caught on the downside and you're withdrawing income also, it really hurts your account value. That's why I protect them from that by wrapping that up in the annuity and then having my dividend-focused asset allocation over here. So I'll complement the income bucket by having the investments here and the investments here being different. Over here, Spectrum, uh, we'll get to that in a second. Spectrum is also 100% equities, it's a 1.9% allocation in 50 different stocks, all 10 sectors. So here we include the infrastructure, technology, retail, etc. All right, we're getting to the good part here, I promise. You guys are doing good. All right, so dividends. The dividend yield is absolutely key. For another Starbucks card, who can tell me what a dividend aristocrat is? Anybody? Not, us. Not you guys, come on. Now. <laughs> Anyone heard the phrase dividend aristocrat? Okay. Dividend aristocrat is a company that has increased its dividend every year for at least 25 consecutive years without missing a beat. 
Now notice I didn't say they've never missed a dividend. I said they've never not increased it. So that means every single year they're paying out more and more in dividends. To be on that list, you have to do that every single year, increase it every single year for 25 consecutive years. Out of the entire stock market, there's only 50, not even, there's 47 companies that are on that list. Of the 25 stocks in tactical income solution, 21 of them are dividend aristocrats. Every time that company raises its dividend, what do your clients get? A raise. Every single time. Imagine having 25 stocks that your clients own, whether it's in tactical growth or tactical income, and they're going to get 21 raises every year, like clockwork, as all of those holdings increase the dividends. In a variable annuity, you have to wait for that step up to happen to get a raise. And it's hard to get a step up. You've got 8.5% drag on that account. In here, the increases happen every single year. Now imagine if every time there was a dividend increase, you called your client up and said, hey, Mike, I wanted to let you know that your Procter & Gamble holding just increased its dividend by 4.5% this year. It's the 37th year in a row they've done that. It's fantastic. Client's like, great, hey, thanks for telling me. That's awesome. Do that every time. I mean, that's a lot of phone calls. I know that's a lot. I'm not saying literally. But imagine the impact that has. When they come in for your semi-annual or annual account reviews, you say, hey, you got 18 raises since I've seen you last time. Really how? Here's how. I'll show you. I'm going to put some numbers to this here. i got some handouts here in a second. Great thing about dividends. This is absolutely key. Really great thing about dividends. If you own a stock that's trading at $100, I'm just using it as a round number, let's say that that stock declared a $3 per year dividend. I'm going to make it a little easier because I'm going to go quarterly. Let's say $4 per share, which equals $1 per quarter. So they're paying $4 a year dividends, dividend per share. If the $100 falls to $97, Dividend is still four bucks, right? Does that affect your client's cash flow at all if that happens to go down a little bit? Not at all. If it goes up to $105, still cash flow is the same. And by the way, you made 5% increase in your appreciation. Life is good. What you do over here is you're allocating money in a way that makes their income stream irrelevant to the account value. You're insulating them. The variable annuity is going to kick out income regardless of the account value at a consistent level, certainty. This is going to kick out an income stream based on this, which has nothing to do with the fluctuation of the account. Now you might be thinking, well, time out, time out. Sometimes companies cut their dividends. You're absolutely right. In the financial crash, 07, 08, 09, financial companies, a lot of them that were paying great dividends, stopped paying dividends altogether. But remember, you don't own those sectors in these portfolios. You're only in consumer food, consumer staples, energy utilities, telecom, pharmaceuticals. All those companies that were slashing dividends left and right in 07, 08, 09, insurance companies, banks, etc., you don't own these over here. These are your core dividend aristocrats. You're going to own some of those companies in the spectrum allocation over here, but that doesn't affect cash flow over here. So with that said, the beauty is, maybe it even falls to 95. And I don't share this kind of stuff with clients. I'm sharing it with you so you're educated on it. That's a good thing. Let's say it falls to 95. Dividend aristocrat. They increase their dividend by, let's say, 10%. Now they're paying $4.40 per share per year. This just went down. Client calls you up, says, hey, you know, I noticed my investments went down a little bit. I thought you said that was the safe bucket. You say, well, it is the safe bucket. You know, in January, the market was down about 5%. This was down about 1%. That's fantastic. And oh, by the way, even though your account is down a little bit in the short term, you just got yourself a 10% raise. Your cash flow is going to be higher. You're going to have more spending money, even though the account's down a little bit. They might say, well, I'm, you know, I'm kind of worried about this. This is supposed to be my safe bucket. And, you, and, you, and I'll counter them. I'll say, 
look, one of the companies you own in this portfolio is McDonald's. If you had $100 in your hand and you had to make a bet and you had to, you had to guess if McDonald's would be a bigger, more profitable company five years from now or a smaller company five years from now, you think McDonald's is going to keep growing? And they say, yeah. I say, good. Growing companies increase their share price over time. Just wait it out, collect your dividend, cash flow is the same, you're in good shape. Right? So the dividend is independent of the fluctuation, and with the variable annuity, the income is independent from the fluctuation. Now, here's the beauty. I guess I said that a few times. Here's the beauty. It's all beautiful. All right, let's see. I've got 10 of these, so just share them if you can. You know you're nerdy when you think numbers are beautiful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, need keep, I need to keep one of these with me here. So pass this around. If Len, Eric, and Rock can share one in the back so they can follow along. We will print out more copies of these before you guys head out. Actually, for the, for, for the employees, don't leave with these. Make sure all the Texas folks leave with these. So make sure all the Texas folks have one of these guys and, and employees share. So then you call the, uh, the uh, those companies the... Uh, dividend aristocrats. Okay, yep. dividend aristocrats, okay? It's a real term. We Google that. So for me, it's going to be DAs from now on. Okay. DAs. DAs. Okay. okay. That's fine. So in 2008, uh, what did the DAs do? Increase the dividends. I mean, as far as January 1st, December 31st, not the tactical income portfolio yep. total, yep. just the 25 security. The, the, the not counting the, the bonds. Right. The average increase was 6.8%. And so their, 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 their market value um, went down. But how like, much? The tactical income solution, we'll get to that. I'll show but you that's, exactly. But that's, but that's including the bonds, right? Yep. And, and then tactical growth. Well, that's the beauty of it. That's the beauty of using this. Yeah. That when, when markets are going down, there's a flight to safety. People sell equities to buy bonds. When, bo when demand is generated for bonds, it pushes bond values up. So even though this part might be faltering, the bond section is holding its own. And you've got a great dividend to boot to keep everything afloat. So did the bonds part help the securities part? Of course, big did? time. Yep, that's by design, absolutely. Because I, I saw it the other way, that if all of those, or 21 of the 25 securities, had a dividend that, that their growth didn't go down that much. Now, they all have dividends, but they're not all aristocrats. Some of them may have increased 20 years in a row, but to be an aristocrat, a DA, has to be 25 years. So I'm going to walk you through the Morningstar reports that will show the best and worst time periods for these models. And where the market was down 40%, tactical income in 2008 was down 9.8%. So it had 25% the downside. So the market was down about 40 in 08, and this was down 9.8%. And your investors collected a, about a 4% dividend to hold it. So they were very, very insulated from, from that. It's Plus a, they got raises along the way, right? Take a look at this. Please don't flip ahead. Just look at the page, that, just stay on this first page. You'll see on the top a starting value of $250,000. Let's assume a starting yield of 3.7%. And every year, the dividend is going to grow by 5.43% on average. $250,000 times 3.7% means your client will receive $9,250 in dividends. That's the yield. Now, we know every year dividends increase by, on average, 5.43%. So in year two, assuming they're taking the dividends, they're not reinvesting. If you reinvest, it's even better, because now you have more shares paying more dividends. Assume that you're taking the dividends. In year two, the dividend cash value is $9,752. In year three, $10,282. Every year, the cash flow they're getting is increasing by, on average, 5.43%. They're getting a raise every year. By the time year seven rolls around, they're receiving $12,704 annually. Based off of what they put in is a 5.08% income stream off their original investment. You're basically matching what the VA is going to do anyway. And if you were reinvesting, it would happen that much sooner before you turn the income on. 
Take it a step further. By year 17, they will have received a total of $250,000 and change of dividend cash flow. Everything they put in just came out to them in dividends, and they never had to sell a share. That's pretty cool. CPAs like that. Yeah. No tax. You're right. No, no capital gain tax. By year 25, I'm gonna, I did 25 years because if you go from age 65 to 90, that's 25 years, typical retirement. Over that full 25-year period, you can see it down here on the bottom, a total of $468,000 of dividends. Almost half a million. Almost twice what you put in just in dividend cash flow. And oh, by the way, your stocks appreciated along the way. So you take out over, over half a million dollars of cash flow and earning just a 3 or 4 or 5% overall appreciation, you're going to double or triple the principal over that period of time too. It's perpetually self-sustaining because the dividends keep kicking out more and more every year, which is how you give yourself a raise here. Now, when you lock in those gains, I shouldn't say lock though, use lock in with clients, when you protect the gains, you don't want to your compliance department to think you're locking in, you know, guaranteeing gains, okay? When you protect gains and you drop those gains into here or here, you drop it in here, you're increasing the income base, their income stream is now based off that higher protected value. When you drop the gains over here, you're buying more shares, which increases the dividend because you earn dividends per share. Doesn't matter if these are up, down, or sideways. You drop money in here, you own more shares, you give your clients a raise, regardless of the price. Again, you're structuring these so the income is independent of the price. That is some phenomenal growth. Look at your, look at your 18. That's a 9% withdrawal rate based on the original investment. Look at your 25, 13.16% withdrawal rate based on the original investment. With a VA, they're getting 5% off the original investment for life unless there's a step up. You don't even have to have a step up over here and you're giving your, your clients a raise every single year. If all their money's in the VA, shame on you because they'll never get a raise if the market doesn't cooperate. If the money's over here, they're going to get a raise every single year. In fact, they're going to get about 21 raises a year. I always have some of this because I like having some mid-cap, small-cap, international stuff in the income side, but I always sprinkle this or this in because it pretty much ensures a raise. When you can ensure a raise, that's insure with an E, not with an I, when you can insure a raise and you have those bad years, you've always got something positive to talk about with your clients. I know Mr. and Mrs. Client, the accounts are down about 8%. No big deal. Markets were down 25, you're down 8. We did our job, that's what you pay us to do. But, oh by the way, your standard of living is going to increase now because your dividends are 6% higher this year than they were last year. Okay, that sounds pretty good, right? That was a, that was a good meeting. Forget about that 8% down stuff, you know. You always have something positive to say. Now, flip to the next page. What I did here is I did the exact same chart, but I used the S&P 500. The S&P 500 current dividend yield is 1.81%, as I wrote up there. The client doesn't even crest the 5% mark until year 21. The total dividends they receive is 229000 over that 25-year period. They don't even get out in dividends what they put in. I mean, talk about drastic difference. If you want to rip, rip these apart and just look at them side to side, we're talking some drastic, drastic differences. Now, Ruben, when, when Rock and I were down in Texas, geez, about a year ago or so, I know you told me you had a client you were working on, or oftentimes you'll hear the objection of, you know, what about Vanguard, you posed to me. Clients will often say, or a prospect will say, well, why don't we just buy Vanguard funds? Why not just buy the index fund? You can buy the index all day long and get this 1.8% yield, or you can buy this, I'll almost double your yield, we'll cut your beta in three and your standard deviation in half. And you're going to get a raise every single year. So clients can buy this and they see how it fits into this. And once they see the cheap index fund laid next to it, it's where do I sign? I don't want that. I want, I want the income solution. 
It's a transformation, and the cost is not an issue. Right. Yeah. So that, that's, how you, that's how you lay that out. Now, let me show you this. This is really cool. Is it beautiful or I just really cool? I, 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 I purposely chose my words. <laughs> just like you sure and ensure. You purposely chose that. I tell you what. Okay. Grab a few of these. Make sure all the Texas guys have one, ladies and gentlemen. All right. I'm going to show you three real case examples of real clients. These are actual statements. I whited out name, address, and account number. Most of the account numbers, so you can at least see that it's the same account number. <clears throat> All right, this person's name, his name is Surin. Uh, not to be too stereotypical, but he's an Indian guy, and they tend to be notoriously analytical with their money. All right, they're very savvy, they know what the heck they're doing. This tactical income solution sold them. All right, it's hard to sell those guys, it's just part of their culture. It just, it just is. What you're seeing here on top is a January 2012 uh, statement. And I want you to see here, the beginning account value was zero. This is literally his first statement. He invested about $1,022,000 into this account. You can see, based on this pie chart, that this is a tactical income solution. You can see the blue, which is 50% stocks, the pink, which is 45% bonds, and the 5% sliver of cash, which is great. Notice on the bottom of this upper right box, estimated annual income, $35,813. That's what he's going to get just to hold his investments. That's just the dividend yield. He's going to get forty grand a year just to show up and stay the course. That's phenomenal. That alone makes the fees irrelevant. He's going to get forty grand a year with zero appreciation. That's awesome. Fast forward to the next page. This is April 2014. This is last month. May is about to end. I don't have a May statement to show you because they haven't come out yet. This is April. Look at his account value. 1.184 made 150 grand of appreciation. And look at his annual income. 44,000, almost 45. Talk about a good conversation. Oh, by the way, you just got to raise it ten grand last year. Now, truthfully, let me rewind a second. If you were using Tactical Income Solution last year, we made some big changes to the bond portfolios back in August. We introduced floating rate funds. We introduced high yield. You guys, as advisors, are paying Liberty One to manage the money for you, so you don't have to worry about it. By introducing some high yield, the floating rate, by completely restructuring the bonds, that definitely gave the yield a boost. So this is not all just because the companies increased their dividend. It's certainly a big piece of it. But I share this with you to say, look, if you were having us manage this allocation for you, an income stream would have went from 35 to 45 in about a year and a half. That is an awesome conversation to have with your clients. And that is why you're paying us to manage this for you. So you can conversate with your clients, bring on more assets, and know that we're taking care of everything on our end. This client could not be happier. $150,000 increase, and oh, by the way, you're making an extra ten grand a year of cash flow. 29%. Now, thank you, Tyler. 29%. <laughs> okay. Now, Surin doesn't need the cash flow. He's actually reinvesting the dividends, which is even better, because then you're buying more shares, and those shares pay dividends. But I'm sharing this with you because that's powerful. It illustrates us managing the money. The yield has gone up significantly. And you can see the principal is a nice ride too. Take, uh, what I like about the April statement, take a look at the April statement. Look at this box. Look at net other activity, $2,925 negative. What is that? The fees. Because fees come out January, April, July, October. That's a fee. Three grand in fees. So now, Sarin, he's a bean counter. He knows where every penny went. Now, he didn't call me up, but I can imagine he called me up. Hey, Ben, I noticed this $3,000 minus sign. 
I'm going to say, I don't see it. I, all I see is that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I see this 13968 positive and dividends of 3100 last month. Now, where are you looking? <laughs> oh, oh right, right between there. Okay, yeah. So you start the month with 1.17. You end the month with 1.84, 1.184, and that's after fees. Now, truthfully, you're going to pay fees also in down months, too. That happens. But when that happens, you say, oh, you know, I'm looking at this, and I see 12 months ago you had 35000 in dividends, and now you have 44000 I think you're going to be okay. Now, I'm not that blunt with clients, but in my head, that's what I'm thinking. I just try, I just try to say it a little more. You filtered it. Filter filter, filter, yeah. <laughs> All right. I've got two more quick examples. This one here. This is our spectrum allocation. This is, this is a neat case. This couple, uh, she owns a, her name is Stephanie. I just told you your name. Okay. I like, I white out the first name. <laughs> you guys take these clients. I know where to find you down there. <laughs> so uh, she owns a, a firm that designs traffic patterns for companies like Walmart and grocery stores. So when, when you want to build a, a big building, a big shopping center, you have to have the traffic flow approved by the county and she designs the traffic flow. She makes big money. She's about 37 years old, makes about six fifty a year. She's one of the partners in this firm. Okay, her husband's pretty high up at Briggs & Stratton, the big engine company up in Milwaukee. So they're young, naturally. Before I met them, my cousin happens to be their CPA. Before I met them, my cousin had them do a bunch of Roth conversions once that became available to them. They were never able to do Roths because of their income bracket, but with the conversion they could. So this is a 37-year-old, and here there's, a, there's about 150000 in Roth IRA money. Now in their grand scheme of things, this basically falls on this side of the equation for what they're building to. So Spectrum is 100% stock, 1.9% in 50 different companies. It has all 10 sectors, the full spectrum of the stock market, with a focus on quality dividend paying stocks. The first page of the first month, this is uh, September of last year. I only share this with you to show you what their starting value was, about 153. Don't pay attention to the annual income because the account wasn't allocated at that point. It just came over in kind, and we still had to deploy it into the spectrum model. <coughs> Take a look at the next page. Now this is October of last year. You can see by the pie chart that they're 94% invested in stocks, and then they've got their sliver of cash. So they're in spectrum now. You might say, well, wait, I thought we were supposed to have a little more in stocks. Like I said, 96%. Well, fees come out. That's what you pay to be in these allocations. So a little out of whack, but very, 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 very close. Notice the estimated annual income, about $4,500. Now, compared to... Syringe's, you know, one point some million account. That doesn't look like as much, but remember, this is based off 150,000. I want you to flip through and only look at estimated annual income. Like clockwork, it goes up every single month. Just glance at it quick. You start at you start at 4,500. Just look at every single month. Eventually, you get to April, and you're up to 4,800. You got calculators, Tyler? I can definitely have it. Why don't you do that for me? $300 divided by $4,500. 6.7. Okay. So they started in October. You're looking at April. In six months, their annual cash flow increased by 6.7%. Now they're they're young, they're reinvesting their dividends. So some of those, some of that increase is because they own a few more shares of everything, and those shares pay dividends. But a big piece of that increase is because they've been increasing their dividends on what they own. They're six months in, October to April, and a six percent increase in dividends. You do that every single year for a 37-year-old, and the compounding effect of those dividends for them over the next 25, 30 years is like, my, it's mind-boggling. They're gonna get so much more in dividends than they're ever even gonna put in, in money, by the time that all rolls up and compounds for them. When you look at the end value, remember, we started at 153, you turn to the last page, 
it's 170, 169, 973. Make $17,000 and we've increased your dividend by 6.9% in six months. Okay. I share this with my cousin, the CPA who referred, you know how many other people is gonna be excited to refer me to? Yeah, you gotta share this, this story. This is phenomenal stuff. I won't even, I won't even show you the, the last one. It's the same story, just told a little different way. So th th this is the real deal. I, I, I'm sharing this with you because I want you to see that we use these all the time. I, I want to show you how they fit in to the, to the story that I tell. And it's so neat for you to see this in practice, see that dividend getting bigger and bigger every single month, see you know, Sarin with over a million bucks, drops it in there, pays the fees, no problem. On those taxable accounts, they always summarize at the end of the year how much was paid in fees because they can write that off on their taxes. When you see it all in one lump sum, they total it all up. Remember, Sarin's paying three grand a quarter times four is 12 grand a year just for that account. You have more money with me. Add up everything, it's like 25, 30 grand in fees. But you can easily overcome that with this kind of story and with this kind of platform. You can't you always have something good to talk about when you're using these, and we design it that way on purpose. So just in, in, in summary, whatever you put over here, you want the income to be generated independent of the account fluctuation. It takes all the emotion off the table. No one else is talking about income in that manner, having the income be independent of the account value. When you talk like that, it's it's the you know, light bulb goes off. You blow your stocks off. Right. You, you, you talk about spectrum. Now, for those fee-sensitive people, I guarantee you any Edward Jones, Ameriprise guy, LPL, whatever, they're using mutual funds 90% of the time with their clients. You do this on the back of a napkin, and then they say, well, what do you put into those? You say, well, we use, we use some dividend-focused models that invest in individual equities. We don't like using mutual funds because you're double layering the expenses. You have the mutual fund expense ratio, and then you've got the advisory fee. Most, most people will do that, and especially if they've got Edward Jones. You can pick which investments they're gonna have without looking at the statement, it'll be American funds. Right? You say, you know, yeah, and, then, and then you say, we go straight to the individual equities because it, reduce, it, it, it eliminates the middleman. There's no expense ratio. For, for individual equities, and oh, by the way, for your taxable money that we're gonna put on maybe this side of the equation, when you have no mutual funds, you have no turnover inside of the mutual fund, and when you have no turnover, you have no capital gain exposure. So not only are we cutting out the middleman, we're reducing your capital gain taxes along the way, and doubling your dividend compared to where you are now. And then it's, it, you're done. 